communication styles that I that are most most seen in businesses. Family business just tends to be a little more intense because you have relationships that are multi-layered. We've seen that three-circle model of family business before, and you know that in there there's at least seven different types of stakeholders. You know, there's the owner, manager, family member. Responsibility guided by our values and nourished by learning. And our shareholders, by being an investment that balances the short and long-term opportunities of our business. Well, thank you for joining us today. I'm Ed Hart, the director of the Family Business Council here at Cal State Fullerton. And with me is Bill Roberts, who just presented to us along with Roy Williams and Dick Hartman from Benefit Concepts about the reasons and some of the, some of the reasons why companies are effective or not effective in passing their business and their wealth on to the next generation. So Bill, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank we you, really I enjoyed, enjoyed the presentation. it. Oh, thank you. We have a great group here. You know, we, we are, are proud of what we have going on here at the Family Business Council and it's, it's sponsors like yourselves who, who really make it work. And I know I get a lot of feedback constantly from our members, very positive about, about you and about the things that you're doing for them and especially from the workshop today. Thank you. You talked about how um, most companies or many companies have trouble passing the business on successfully to the next generation. What are some of the reasons that you see in your research and in your work with companies as to why they aren't successful in passing the businesses on? Mm -hmm. We we see uh, probably procrastination is one of the first reasons and they just aren't quite sure where to turn to address the issue. Um, but some of them are just a lack of communication okay. among family members, uh, maybe some distrust there. And so it's it's not it's difficult for uh, the, for that conversation to open, and probably the one that we see most often is the senior generation not willing to give up control and pass that along. Interesting. So it's not necessarily so it's a little bit of everything kind of they they procrastinate it or they think oh we're fine nothing's going to happen to right. us for 15 20 years. I'm not going to die. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not going to die. We'll cross that bridge later. Yeah. Or again, that, that wanting to control it. Now, what are some of the risks that you hear from that these people are not willing to take? Maybe they want to control it because they think it's too risky. What are some of the big risks that you see? Well, I, I think giving up control is probably the biggest one. Um, some is just a fear of the, of the um, tax law and the changing tax law and the changing regulations and the fact that we don't have much um, solid evidence as to which way the government and law is going to go. So they have some concerns about that. Are, is the planning that we do today still going to work tomorrow? And so they're concerned about that. But I, but I think it, it really revolves more around personal relationships and, and making, not wanting to disrupt the family too much and making, in some cases, not wanting to make choices sure. among family members. Do you see a lot of family tension between siblings? So for example, mom and dad own the company and how do we, as you talked about earlier, the equal way versus the equitable way to pass yeah. the company on? How, how big does that play? Uh, that can definitely become an, an issue among family, uh, family members, operating and non-operating family members. Sure. Uh, definite, definite, some definite tension there, but it is something that can be resolved through communication and building the trust and communicating what the company is doing for all family members, not just the family members who are employed there. Well, let's end this interview on a good note and a positive note. You did talk about, rather than focusing now on the 70% who haven't been doing it well, let's talk about those 30% who do. What is it that you see? What are some of the common den denominators that you've been able to find through your studies and research and working with your clients that they all tend to do very well so they do effectively pass the business on? Yeah, I, I think the one that I would, I would single out first is they are, they are willing to face the issue and know that it's coming and so consequently they are dealing with the issue in an open way. Uh, levels of communication in those families are generally very high and, and as they go through the process it tends to increase rather than decrease so they don't end up with more distrust they end up with more trust and I think also they, they, uh, they look for and find uh, advisors that are knowledgeable, first of all, but secondly, are understanding of the uniqueness of the family business. And those advisors provide, hopefully, wise advice to them, and then they implement, they don't just leave it on, the, uh, on their back burner. Awesome, so they're able to take action and be a little bit proactive as opposed to just yes. not thinking that uh, we're, we're going to be fine. As you mentioned before, oh, I'm not going to die anytime soon, yeah. we're fine. Right. Now, Bill has co-authored a book called The Keys to Family Business Success. Tell us a little bit, Bill, about that book. Where can we find it? 
How did that begin? What was the process that launched that, that uh, project? Uh, I'm also a member of the Aspen Family Business Group, which is a group of uh, family business consultants uh, who've been in the business for 30 plus years, advising family businesses on this, this whole issue of uh, succession, uh, dealing with issues within the family, and we decided to write a book. And our goal was to write a book that was to the family business men and people themselves rather than to the advisors to the business. And we tried to write it in a way that someone could pick it up and they could find a checklist for issues that they, that they may have within the business for those who like checklists. Mm -hmm. uh, they could find stories in it that uh, would maybe uh, illustrate issues that they have within the business that they could relate to. And we also have some theory in there, kind of what's behind it. So we tried to appeal to what different people would want to have in terms of the book. And then uh, lastly, we put together a list of best business practices that through 30 years or so, amongst all of these, they've observed these are the things that good businesses do when they had developed a good succession plan. Excellent, excellent. So where can we find this book? The book is available on Amazon. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's uh, easy to find, the Keys to Family Business Success. and. Uh, it's just out, so it's relatively new, but we are getting some excellent reviews. Excellent. Well, Bill, thank you very much again for yeah. joining us today. We really enjoyed the panel. You did a great job. I know that our members left with a lot of tools that they can use. And as the conversations that I've had with people coming out today, several were saying, wow, these are some things, like you mentioned, that we really haven't thought about that we really need to give more attention to. So if nothing else, thank you for prompting everybody on our council to really start thinking more in terms of you know, I may die someday. What am I yeah. going to do? Or I may want to retire and go play golf. What yeah. do I do with the business when that time comes? So yeah. thanks again. Well, Ed, thanks for the opportunity. You have a wonderful group of families. My pleasure, Bill. Thank you very you much. Bet. And just a reminder, as we had with Bill and his associates today, we do these workshops every month. They're designed to really, as we did today, provide tools and techniques and information for our members to use when they go back to their business later this afternoon or the next day. I was convinced to, to do that not too long ago, probably a year ago. And not only did we have them read it, but we had them meet with the attorneys and put it together yeah. without us in there. And they spent about an hour and a half just finding out and discussing all of it. And <coughs> what I heard from my kids afterwards was just really positive. They had just had no idea of a lot of the different things. And it got them, there's five of them, got them to be able to talk about it together openly with people that could really answer some of the questions. And it was just, uh, I think it was one of the best things that we've done. I'm hearing there's a lot more. You know, one interesting thing to, to, to the second on that, get them to participate the next time you do it, in a year or so, get them to participate in the, in the redrawing of it. Okay, based upon your values that the whole family uses, and then get the lawyer to sit on that meeting, and it will change every document you have. Next month on November 15th, we have a woman by the name of Meredith Elliott Powell who will be coming out and speaking to us on selling in a trust and value economy. The, the workshop isn't really about sales and sales skills, but it's how do we more effectively sell and relate to people, especially now when business is tight, the economy is tough, and it's just, you know, we're all having to tighten our belts a little bit. What can we do to really make our companies and our, our products and services really stand out? So come join us on November 15th. It'll be 4.30 to 7.30 p.m here at Cal State Fullerton, and we look forward to seeing you. Thank you very much.